waiting on you. <laughs> Jesus goes first. Praise, Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. It's good to be in the house of the Lord tonight. Amen. to have everyone here tonight. Amen. No guests. But hey, thank you for your faithfulness. Amen. Amen. God will honor it. I know it's hard sometimes. Amen. I know it's hard. Yeah. The work day wears on you. The early mornings wear on you. Then you come and you think about being at church until nine o'clock at night. It weighs on you. Yeah. Hey. Hey, it's a sacrifice. Amen. I I can concur with that, and I, anybody that, that works in the workforce understands, it's a sacrifice to come to a midweek service, amen, but what a blessing it is, amen, amen. and the rewards are eternal, amen, amen. Our junior Bible quizzes are going to a retreat this weekend in Beaumont, uh, they are asking for prayer, amen, the parents are asking for prayer, uh, I think that's the only thing keeping Jackson out of Bible quizzing. Because <laughs> I don't know that I got what it takes, Amen. So I know it's a, I know it's hard for the parents. It's, that, there's a major challenge there as the ushers make their way. I know it's the, the weight is on the parents, Amen. So let's pray for them that the Lord would help them, Amen, and the children as well. Uh, we'll just pray for them in a covering as they travel. And the Lord would keep them. And uh, it's hard. I know it's been said before. A lot of every church prays for the Bible quizzing. Everybody involved is in church, and they all pray, you know, and so we just pray that God would, would honor their efforts and their work and bring to their remembrance what they have put in in study and in prayer, and that, uh, that they are able to grab a hold of what they've put in. Uh, at the end of the, this month, April 27th and 29th, is Men's Conference up in Lufkin, Texas. Yes. Uh, you want to be there if you're a man. It's always good. Uh, it's always good. If nothing else, the fellowship with the brethren of the church is huge. It's huge. Uh, you, 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 you get to know the other men outside of church, uh, and, and, it, and it makes a difference. Um, it, it, brings, it brings unity, camaraderie. Uh, it brings the body of Christ closer together. Uh, it, it just works. Ladies' conference is the same way. Uh, and so men's conference, if you don't plan on going, um, look at your calendar, see if you can squeeze it in. Uh, it'll be worth every effort to go. That's, that's April 27th and 29th. Uh, if you have any questions, you can see Brother Chris Buchanan. Uh, he's running around here tonight, uh, but he'll be here if you have any questions concerning that. Uh, as the ushers are standing ready, uh, as far as prayer requests tonight, we need to continue to pray for Brother Phillips. Uh, he has been uh, moved to rehab facility, um, and so let's just continue to pray for him and also Sister Esther uh, as she's standing close by him uh, and helping him through this situation. Uh, Donna Bradshaw is also in need of prayer tonight, as well as Tyler Johnson and those that are not able to be here tonight. Uh, if you look around and see an empty chair that's usually filled, that's probably them. Uh, so let's remember the those that are not here. And of course, if you have an unspoken request you'd like to make known by a lifted hand of faith, amen, as we go before the Lord tonight. Father, we're grateful for the opportunity to gather together one more time. What a privilege it is to stand in your house, so God, with people of like precious faith. Lord, nobody knows like you know the burdens that are bared, the weights that we carry. Lord, you see and know the loads that are being shouldered right now. You see sickness and and you see, Lord, and know uh, what Brother Phillips is fighting in his body. And we're praying together tonight, God, on his behalf. Lord, that you would touch him, Lord, where he lies right now. Lord, that you would visit him and let him feel the comfort of the presence of God. Lord, that the prayers of the saints of God would go to where he is. Lord, and help comfort his body. Give strength to Sister Esther as she walks beside him in this time of recovery. Lord, praying for strength over her, a renewed strength in her spirit, Lord. She would bless her and be with her. Sister Bradshaw, tonight, God, you see and know the need that's in her life. 
You know the prayer that she's asking for, Lord, and what the situation is, Father. And we're praying in her behalf tonight, God, that you would move into her life and into her situation. Lord, that you would make a way where there seems to be no way. Lord, that you would allow her to feel the presence of God tonight. Lord, just to feel comfort in the Holy Ghost, Lord, for Tyler Johnson and those that are not here tonight. God, we're praying that you would allow them to be touched, Lord, where they are. Lord, we pray for comfort. We pray for strength, Lord. We pray for those situations that uh, that were unseen. Lord, we pray a covering over every need in this house, every unspoken request, every lifted hand of faith tonight, God. You know like nobody else knows. Lord, you know where we are and what we have need of before we ever ask. And so we pray in faith, believing that your word is true. And if we ask, we shall receive. And if we not, the door would be open. And so here we stand, your children, those that bear your name. And we ask and thank tonight, Lord, that you would hear us from heaven. Lord, that you would move mountains and make a way tonight, God, where there seems to be no way. Lord, help us with our faith, Lord. Help us, God, even in the midst of the trial, not to lose hope and lose faith in you. I pray a covering tonight, God. Bless this offering as we give in faith. Lord, as we give, God, for the furtherance of the gospel and the kingdom of God. I pray, Lord, that you would multiply it for your glory. That you, would give, that you would give back as only you can. That we can continue to be a blessing, Lord. We give you thanks tonight. And we give honor to you in Jesus' name we pray. Lord, in your name tonight, we pray, God, that your will be accomplished in every need, in every situation. Lord, our hope and our trust and our confidence is in you. We are of ourselves nothing. We can do nothing. We have no strength. We have no power. God, our reliance is in you, God. Our hope, our trust, and our confidence is in you alone. Help us tonight, God. Restore the weak here tonight, God. Let there be strength in this house, Lord. Those that bear the burdens, God, that are too heavy for them, let them feel the undergirding of the Holy Ghost. I pray, God, your will be done in this place, Lord. Let chains be broken, yokes utterly destroyed by the anointing. We give you glory tonight, God. Oh, that your will be done, Lord. We just want to see your glory and your will accomplished. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, as the ushers wait on you tonight. When I was in Bible college, Uh, They would teach us that if you're going to study the word and you want to see uh, a consistency, you always would go back to the very first place of mention. And it would help you to understand uh, other areas of the Bible where it was uh, a a similar situation. And I can only think, going back to Genesis chapter 1, We find that the Spirit of God moves. And then not long after that, God begins to speak. And the world begins to take form. And and so in my mind, I think, okay, if God speaks, then nothing can stop the Word of God. Not emptiness, not darkness, not void. Nothing can stop the utterance of God's voice when He speaks. Nothing. And so if a promise has ever been spoken, nothing can stop it. If the word has ever been planted in your heart, nothing can stop it. If if God's ever promised something over your family or over your life, nothing can stop it. And so then we would visit the persistent widow who just kept going back and going back and going back so mama i tell you just keep going back when the word of god was spoken hey man just be persistent when the hour you think not god will do it cornelius just keep being consistent in an hour you think not the word of god will be fulfilled let's worship tonight as if it's already done
Let's worship tonight as if it's already done. No more change. 
you lift your voices right now unto the Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Somebody shout hallelujah right now. Come on, the Spirit will break out through those that praise Him, through those that worship Him, through those that lift their voices unto Him. Hallelujah. It's not going to break out because we don't praise Him. It's going to break out in the middle of praise because the praise is where God inhabits. Praise is where God makes His self known. Praise is where it goes. When we give God all the praise and all the adoration, that's when He starts to fall. That's when He starts to move mountains. That's when He starts to do things. That's when heaven starts to touch earth. When we praise God. When we make a place for Him to inhabit. When we give Him all the honor and glory. Clap your hands unto God right now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, praise team. Thank you so much. I want to say a great big thank you to our praise team led by Brother Colin Shemansky for a tremendous Resurrection Sunday service. Amen. Brother Colin, thank you so much. And to this praise team, I believe that they deserve honor. Amen. Hallelujah. Anointed singing on Sunday. I want to thank Brother Guzman and all the men that helped out with the baptistry. Got to baptize William for the first time in our baptistry here at the church. Amen. Excited about what God's... Listen, it's gonna, the waters are stirred, y'all. God's going to continue to do that. Amen. Amen. I also want to thank John Prince. Thank you so much for taking pictures and video on Sunday during church. You did a great job, tremendously wonderful pictures and video. Let's give him a hand, amen. Hallelujah, amen. Thankful for him. I also wanna say a great big thank you. He's not here tonight, to, but, but to Brother Clancy. The week of sacrifice, we had the week of sacrifice on Sunday, culminated Sunday with our offering. The Clancy was over this this year, and I'm thankful for him and his for his work. We raised over thirty thousand dollars for the week of sacrifice. Woo! Tremendous, tremendous, Brother Clancy. Thank you so much for helping with that. Amen. And I would be remiss if I did not give a great big shout out to Sister Mindy Shemansky for all that she does for our social media, all that she does for promoting the church, all that she does for keeping things together, all that she does. I want to give her a great big hand clap. Also, she is tireless in promoting the church and the body of Christ, and she does a fantastic job of that, and I want to say thank you. Amen. Amen. I'm going to hopefully give us some help tonight, but I want, I'm not going to start with a scripture. I know you're ready for that, but I've got about 30 scriptures. Brother Chris is like, my goodness, we got some scripture tonight. Amen. Over the past few months, we have had... Many of our children seem to shoot up. <laughs> yep. Amen. I mean, I remember when Jilly was just a little girl and we could hold her in our arms. I can't hold her in my arms no more. Well, I can. It's just going to hurt. <laughs> She's in the youth group now. I remember when she was at the barn and she was being held by Sister Mindy. And she had a pretty little... I remember that. Remember Kale, when we used to go to her house for Bible study and, and, and we used to, Sister Minnie would sit in that room with you, she was tiny. She'd have all her stuffed animals everywhere. <laughs> Amen. But now look at her, she's growing up and Danielle, where's she at? I saw her. Girl, you have doubled in size height-wise <laughs> since I first remember you coming and then Bryden was swinging in trees. That's why we started to cut down trees, because Bryden would be swinging in trees. Amen. It's all, it's surprising how quick they grow. Amen. Surprising. High school. It's just around the corner. College is not too far away. Then they moved to other cities like Ethan did. And I say, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I like them at home. Yeah. Our children are maturing. Right. And it seems unavoidable. Yeah. Nothing, it seems, can keep them from growing. Now, I'm talking about physical maturity at this point. 
although it is possible to, to see a child ma mature in the way that they use language, the way that they grow up, the way that they do things, but how do we look at spiritual maturity? How do we look at growing spiritually? It's one of our core values at the church, spiritual maturity. To be spiritually mature. So what does that mean? How, does, how do we know that someone is, quote, growing up in the Lord? Hallelujah. So tonight I'm going to give us seven road signs or markers of what it means to be spiritually mature. So I'm defining this night as keeping it real, spiritual maturity. You may be seated. Thank you so much, Sister Elizabeth. Keeping it real, defining spiritual maturity. I am so thankful that I am not mature. Really? Now, Colin, you laugh. I know you're not mature. <laughs> In fact, your mother called you a joke. <laughs> Stir. <laughs> We were having a, she called him a joke. It was, she meant joke stir. She did not call him a joke. Amen. But let's talk about spiritual maturity. Number one, I gave you a handout so you know you can take this with you. Spiritual maturity is the ability to tolerate an injustice without seeking revenge. It's to tolerate an injustice without seeking revenge. Romans chapter 12 verse 19 says, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place under wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Let me say this with all sincerity and honesty. God has the wisdom to know what is best in your situation. He has the wisdom. He understands all of what's going on. He understands what happened. He understands how it happened. He understands the ins and outs of what happened. He understands all of it. But we should be aware of another principle found in Deuteronomy chapter 32. And verse 35, to me belongeth vengeance and recompense. Their foot shall slide in due time. For the day of their calamity is at hand, and the things that shall come upon them make haste. How often have you seen that a person so intent on revenge falls into a rage and causes himself or herself more harm than the person they're angry at? Think about it. It's, uh, I've heard it said that when you, when you seek revenge, it's like you trying to hand, you're going to drink the poison and expect them to die. It hurts you more than it hurts them. Listen, God knows when we've been hurt, and God knows. He's aware of all the situations. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 14 says, Alexander, the coppersmith, did much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works. Of whom be thou aware also, for he hath greatly withstood our words. A mature person can wait for God to take care of things. Yep. Amen? Amen? How many of you have ever wanted to bury somebody out back? <laughs> How many of you have ever <laughs> you all laughing? <laughs> wanted to cut them off at the knees and say, I don't know what happened to them. They just got really short. Can you imagine what Alexander felt after Paul said that? Imagine what Alexander the coppersmith felt after Paul gave that admonition. I don't know about you, but I'd be pretty afraid. I am more afraid of God's vengeance than I am of yours. Amen? 
I'm more afraid of what God thinks and what God wants to do than I am of what anybody in this room or anybody online wants to do. Listen, you can threaten me, you can kill me, you can do all that stuff, but I'm more afraid of what he thinks. And trust me, I've been done wrong before, but my, it's not my vengeance, it's not my revenge to have. I've got to learn to tolerate the injustice and let God do what God does best. He's going to make a way. He's going to take care of the situation. He might bless them in the backside and help them understand what they did. But we got to give God the time to do that. The first sign of maturity is to tolerate injustice and let God fight the battle. The second sign of spiritual maturity is patience. Oh, yuck. He said that word. Watch this. It's the willingness to postpone immediate gratification in favor of long-term gain. The willingness to postpone immediate gratification in favor of long-term gain. Amen. We live in a society that wants immediate gratification. Right. Prime shipping. <laughs> we pay for it. I was excited because Sunday I was able to order a part that came in Monday morning and we could have a washing machine again. We want it done now. Walmart makes millions on two-hour delivery. Kroger, click and shit. Think about immediate gratification. Whole Foods, two-hour delivery. We don't like to wait. Some of you are already impatient. You're ready for the message to be over. But understand this, in my years as a pastor and as a saint of God, I have learned to wait. Sometimes I wait too long, but really, I'm really waiting patiently for the kingdom of God to come into focus. There are things I could handle and take care of immediately right now, and I could blow up the barn to kill the mouse. But if I wait just a little while longer, God starts to work the work. God starts to do things in the background just because I'm patient. Just because I've waited. Think about this. Moses had a stark choice to make when he left Egypt. He, had, he could have had everything. And by the way, if you keep looking for the burning bush to talk to you, it only happened once with Moses. If you keep going up to bushes wanting to know, well, what's it going to happen, God? What's it going to happen? It's only one bush one time. It takes time sometimes for God to let all pieces fall into place. Amen. He could have bluffed his way out of the situation when he found himself murdering one of the guards. He could have done that. He could have been restored right back to Pharaoh's court, Pharaoh's court but he did not do that. He went out in the backside. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 24 and 25. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Right. He had to wait. That song, while I'm waiting. We don't like to wait. We don't. Life is short. The old saying is you can't go back. Is there anybody in this room that has no regrets? <laughs> You've got regrets. <laughs> Psalms chapter 37 verse 1 fret not thyself because of evildoers neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity for they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb trust in the Lord and do good so shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily shalt thou shalt be fed. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. When we reflect patience in the things we don't understand yet, we show spiritual maturity. 
when we wait patiently on God, we show spiritual maturity. How many of you have ever wanted your child to grow up? Now. How many would you like your spouse to grow up right now? When you are a mature saint in God, you'll learn to wait in patience. I think sometimes we expect God to be that ATM machine when it comes to the altar service. We want him to meet it, be there. I put my pin code in. I gave a little praise. Bring it on. And you know what? He says, "Uh uh-uh, won't happen right now. You're not ready for it yet. When I talk about prayer, this is one of the things you've got to learn to be patient in your prayer time because there's a lot of times God won't take you deeper because you're not ready for it yet. So you got to be patient. You got to be patient. You got to be. You got to make sure your character's right. You got to make sure your integrity is there. You got to make sure all those things are right, and then God starts to move you into those places. But that takes patience. Amen. Amen. So stay patient. Stay patient. Number three. Oh, I'm going to go through these pretty good. Spiritual maturity is the ability to face frustration, defeat, discomfort, without complaint, or falling out. How many times have you seen that one person fall out because of a disappointment? Or they get frustrated. And next thing you know, forget God. I'm out. By the way, it also means we won't find someone else to blame. They did that to me. I can't believe they told me that. I can't believe they said, yeah, and then you fall out. If we're going to be spiritually mature, we've got to learn to, in our frustration, in the things that go on in our life, we've got to hold on. We can't let that defeat and that frustration and that discomfort cause us to not to walk away from God, to fall out from God, to complain to a God. God's tired of our complaints. He is. Well, thank God to be there. Be there. Do you think I don't see that? Do you think that I... I'm wondering what's going to happen to you. God doesn't charge us by what happens to us. He charges us based upon how we respond to what happens to us. Amen? When trials come, whether they are in the church or outside the church, spiritually mature people handle it. Amen? Amen. We all do well in comfortable conditions. But if I turned, I can tell you right now, a couple weeks ago, I had the heat on in here. And it was hot outside. And y'all were like, you want to turn the air on? I didn't realize it was off. See, we do well when it's comfortable and the AC's on. We do well when it's when, when things are going good, we do well when everything seems to be working perfect. But when all of a sudden the hot water starts happening. <laughs> this happened to me this weekend. When I washed the machine, my wife, now I'm used to, now I understand. I was working on that. I was fixing that this weekend, trying to fix the plumbing. Brother Walter, thank you for putting me over plumbing. <laughs> I hate plumbing. But he put me over plumbing, and he said, hey, can you plumb that so we can get out? I said, absolutely, I can get it plumbed. And I had frustration after frustration after frustration. And finally, I got so contorted underneath that thing. I got, I got a pulled muscle right here in my neck. I'm getting too old. My knee was killing me. I'm thinking, what is going on? Now, I can sit here and complain about it all day long. And I can say, oh, my gosh. But I'm not doing that. I'm really not. I hurt. But I'm not doing that. What happens, listen, what happens when God says no? 
What happens when pastor says no? I don't care what pastor says. What happens when defeat, listen, is inevitable? See, we have this beautiful picture of God that he's always going to be victorious. He is. He didn't say we will always be victorious. He said he is. There's going to come some defeats in our life that we have to go through in order to strengthen us. In order to make us who we need to be for him. There's going to come things in our life. Listen, the tea bag is only as good as the hot water that goes through it. And what's in the tea bag comes out. Put somebody in a situation to where all of a sudden they're frustrated and you'll see what comes out. Hallelujah. You ever, you ever do that with your wife? You just get, or your kids? Red faced. I'm going to choke and strangle them. James chapter 1, verse 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. My brother, count it all joy. Woohoo! When you fall into divers' temptations. Are you serious, God? Whoa, whoa. Joy. Knowing this, that the trying. Of your faith worketh, second sign, patience. Amen. Watch this, though. I want to bring our attention to this verse 4. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. You want to know what that word perfect means? Mature. That you may be mature. There is a well-known saying, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. <laughs> Amen? There's going to come a time where toughness is there. A spiritually mature individual will learn how to deal with the, the things going on in their life. They're going to learn how to deal with those things. Philippians chapter 4, verse 11. Not that I speak in respect of one, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. Oh, that word content. It doesn't say contempt. It says content. That is a spiritually mature individual. A great step to maturity is to stop blaming others for our own problems. Will he, will she, will they, will he, will pastor, will... By the way, that was the first thing that happened in the garden. Thank you, Brother Nick, for bringing up Genesis. Well, she... We've been blaming them ever since. Give me my rib back. No, 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 no. God said, Adam... It's your fault. Genesis chapter 3, verse 12 and 13. And the man said, the woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the woman, what is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, the serpent beguiled me and I did eat. Blaming somebody else. <laughs> Bottom line was that Adam should have been protecting his wife. And the wife should have listened to Adam. So they're both at fault. Quit blaming the other one for, for what's going on. Your, listen, if you're spiritually mature, you don't worry about blame. You just say, okay, God, if you're trying to teach me something, teach me now. I'm listening. If you're trying to go, you help me get through something, help me, Lord. I want to learn from this situation. If you're going through it, don't blame others for what's happened. Don't blame others because the bottom line is this. You've got a choice in your response. You've got a choice in your response on how you deal with it. You've got a choice in whether you're going to give God the praise or you're going to give devil the opportunity to come in. It's your choice to make, and it's your choice to make it every single day. It's up to you to become mature and make the choice, the right choice, and say, God, if you're working it out with patience and tribulation, then here I am. I'm going to fall into diverse temptations, but I know you're working it out for me. You're going to give me joy at the end of this. There's going to be joy through this, and I'm just going to trust you. Hallelujah.
Four, spiritual maturity is the ability to evaluate a situation, make a decision, and stay with it. Spiritually immature people are generally indecisive. Well, I could. Well, that's what you want to know what altar call is. <laughs> it's it's the line drawn for the spiritually mature and immature. Because I can stand back here and say, "Well, I'm not sure I should go up there right now." I prayed through, I've been in the prayer room, I've done all that stuff, but you know what? Nah, I'll just stay here. And there's people, guests, people here, and saints of God are standing back. Oh, Jesus. Want to know why I taught altar working? Because I'm trying to mature you. Amen? Spiritually immature people are generally indecisive. Should I stay or should I go now? That was a joke. Spiritually immature people, you ready? Are always interested on in what's on the other side of the fence. I wonder what that church is doing. I wonder what they're saying. I wonder how they shift from one thing to another. From one church to another. From one doctrine to another. There's always a possibility of something else. But spiritual immaturity. Listen. Spiritual immaturity is someone who is changing their minds and methods. And in the end they accomplish very little. But a spiritually mature person. Won't worry about what everybody else says. Won't worry about what happens on the other side of town. Won't worry about what's going on somewhere else. A spiritually mature person will say, the word of God is my light and my path. The word of God will lead me where I need to go. As long as they're preaching the word and they're bringing the word to me, that's a safe place for me to go. As long as they're giving me what I need and feeding my family and making it a safe place for salvation to happen. As long as they're preaching the word of God, that's a safe place. A spiritually mature person will recognize that and not worry about what the winds of doctrine say. Won't worry about what the next new program is. Won't worry about that thing. They're just going to go ahead and follow the word of God and stay in the word of God and stay in the prayer room. Spiritually mature people don't make plans on a whim. They get the facts. Amen? They seek counsel. And not only seek it, they obey it. Hallelujah. They choose the right people to get advice from. If you're out there getting advice from people who are backslidden, it's probably not good. Well, I think I'll talk to them. They haven't been in church in two years, but they're a good person. Make sure you know who you're getting counsel from. And by the way, a multitude of counsel is where there's safety. It doesn't say from one. It says a multitude. You ought to have a board of elders in your life, including your pastor, that you can go to and say, hey, how do you think about this? What do you feel about this? I'm not going to tell you everything that, I'm not going to, you make the decision. That's what we're talking about here. You got to make the decision and stay with it. You can't put it on the pastor. You can't put it on the church. You can't put it on the ministry. You can't put it on a Sunday school teacher. You've got to make the decision. I'll help you. I'll guide you. I'll tell you what the word says. But you've got to make the choice and stay with it. There's nothing worse than somebody who's in the middle. The Lord calls it somebody who I want to vomit out. I'd rather you be hot or cold. Because in the middle, I'm going to spew you out. Listen, the greatest mature Christians make a decision and stay with it. Do you think it's hard? Yes. There's times where it's so hard, you don't want to go through it. There's times where it's so hard, you're like, I'm not seeing the end of this. I'm no, there's not a, listen, it feels like the tunnel keeps getting built. But can I tell you, if you hold on, 
God will make a way. If you hold on, God will show you the way. If you hold on and stick with it, God will stick with you, and you won't have to worry. Yes, there might be a turn here or a turn there, but if you stay with God and stay spiritually mature, you'll hit the goal that God has for you. Right. And by the way, he has a goal for you. Right. Amen? It's, yes, it's heaven. We can expect a mature, spiritually, uh, spiritually mature person to go to someone spiritually immature. You can't do that. I go to my pastor, who has way more wisdom than me, for advice, for counsel. And there's times where I'm like, I don't want to. Yes, sir. And I have found it has saved me headache and heartache. Listen, spiritually mature people have spiritual goals. Say, I got to have spiritual goals. Whether that's prayer, warfare, faith to increase, witnessing more, whatever it is, have some spiritual goals and stick to it. How many have a spiritual goal? How many of you know what a spiritual goal is? You ought to say, you know what? I want to get deeper in prayer. I want to see some things happen in my life. I want to see opportunities open up. I want to see this. I want to, I want to pray this. I want to fast this. I want to do some spiritual things. You ought to have some goals. Because you know what? You can hit everything that you don't know about. I don't have any goals. Well, you'll hit it. You'll hit it. Have some spiritual goals. Take it to God in prayer. Explore what God thinks about it. If a new plan's called for, don't just jump in on a win. Take it to God. Amen? I want you to read Proverbs chapter 24, verse 21. My son, fear thou not, uh, fear thou the Lord and the king, and meddle not with them that are given to change. Woo. Don't mess with the ones that are always changing. Don't go with them. An immature person moves from one thing to the other. They're easily bored and frustrated. But someone who is spiritually mature will show contentment. Say contentment. Amen. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 14. That we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Consistent people are people who have matured to the point where they can think of others before themselves. By the way, this is becoming very rare in present day Christianity. It is. It's very rare nowadays that people think about others. It's all about what they can get from God for themselves. But can I tell you this? God never gave us the spirit to hold on to. He gave us the spirit to give out to. Hallelujah. Let me say that again. It's not about the giftings that God gave us. It's how we use the giftings to reach the world. It's how we use the giftings he's placed in us to reach out to others. It's how we take the word of God that he's given to us and saved us from the uh, certain hell and brought it to others who need the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's how we take what we've been given and give it back out. Hallelujah. James 1 and 5. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. Verse 6. But let him ask in faith nothing wavering. How many of you have ever prayed a prayer that was a waver? If you want to, God. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. Well, verse 8. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. That means a set mind is a spiritually mature mind. Set thoughts are a spiritually mature thought process. Knowing that I'm not going to waver, God, to the left or to the right, but I'm going to keep my focus on you, that's a sign of a spiritually mature person. Number five, 
Spiritually mature people will demonstrate humility. Humility. Humility is being big enough to say I was wrong. Humility, when we are spiritually mature, does not say I told you so. Hallelujah. King David admitted his sin. He matured into a man after God's own heart. Verse Psalm chapter 51, verse 4. Against thee, thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. A spiritually mature person knows that he ultimately offends God, not man. You ultimately offend God, not man. And by the way, it's difficult to admit when you're wrong. In fact, the hardest thing for most of us to say is I was wrong. David did not admit his sin at first. Think about it. He tried to cover it up just like the rest of us. Whoa, no, 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 God. And when the prophet walked in and said, no, it's you. You've been found out. But he spiritually matured and he took responsibility for his actions. Listen, don't gloat when you're right. Please don't gloat when you're right. It's very immature. Proverbs 27 and 2, I've got scripture for it. Let another man praise thee and not thine own mouth. A stranger and not thine own lips. Spiritual maturity comes when we have and demonstrate humility. Say humility. humility. Number six, spiritual maturity is dependability. Dependability. Keeping your word coming through in a crisis. Staying in unity with the body even when it is hard to do. Staying in unity with the body, even when it's hard to do. There's plenty of people that make excuses and alibis. They don't do ministry because of small things. They don't get involved because of past things. They're nowhere to be found when there's work to be done around the church. And they break promises and they dump friends and they quit in the middle of jobs. I feel in 2023, and I'm thankful that it's not in this church. I haven't seen it in this church. Thank God I haven't seen it, but there's many Christians who want to keep their word only when it's convenient. Amen? Not when it's essential. Can I say this? Every ministry in this church is essential. Every ministry in this church is essential. Every single one, from the nursery to the hospitality crew, to the sound crew, and media, to praise and worship, to grounds, to e everything is essential to the ministry of this church. Everything that we do is essential to the ministry of the church. Listen, if Christ only sacrificed when it was convenient, he'd still be alive today. If he only sacrificed when it was convenient, Christ be alive today. But he is reliable and faithful to us. He was faithful in the throes of a beating. He was faithful in the midst of hammer blows and spears in his side. Jesus Christ was faithful unto death. Spiritual maturity is someone who is trustworthy. Trustworthy with their words. Trustworthy with their actions. Trustworthy with their ministry. And trustworthy with their gifting. Right. Trustworthy and faithful to the ministry. Number seven, and it's a quote by Peter Marshall, and this is the last sign of spiritual maturity. It's living at peace with the things we cannot change. The courage to change the things we can change and the wisdom to know the difference. I want you to repeat after me. I have to change myself. myself. 
I got to change it. It's not the church's job to change you. It's not the preacher's job to change you. It's our job as an individual to change ourselves into what God wants. The greatest tragedy of Christianity is not the immature. It's the one who thinks they're spiritually mature. Let me say that again. The greatest tragedy of Christianity is not the immature. It's the person who thinks that they are spiritually mature and there's nothing else they can do to mature. I never, ever, ever want to get so mature that I think I've got it all figured out. I want the last day of my life to be a day that I learn something new about God. Right. Yes. Amen. Yes. Joshua chapter 24, verse 24. And the people said unto Joshua, the Lord our God we will serve and his voice will we, will we obey. Listen, our maturity is measured by our ability to get along with other people. Amen. Let's talk about some characteristics of People that are mature, they accept other people for who they are. They avoid labeling other people. They don't call people names or give them a false impression. Listen, if we label a group or a person or a group of people, we blind ourselves because we tend to stop thinking about them and accept them. And instead, we make a gross oversimplification of who they are. There's nothing worse than making a gross oversimplification of who a saint of God is. I don't care who they are. I have had thoughts, and I've told this to our leadership team over the years. There's everybody that walks through these doors could be the next John the Baptist. Could be the next great missionary like Benny DeMerchant. They can go, they can build church after church after church. We don't know. So don't oversimplify who they are in God. God created us and made us in his image and his likeness. And he said, greater things than these shall ye do. And they're part of that ye. Right. Amen. Right. So don't oversimplify somebody that you think is a drunkard. Don't oversimplify somebody that you think is a prostitute. Don't oversimplify somebody that you think is an addict. Don't oversimplify somebody that doesn't dress like you or look like you or act like you or talk like you. Don't oversimplify the one that doesn't seem to be coming along. Don't oversimplify those people because they're in the image of God. They are something in God. They are something that God can do with. They are somebody that God can still put his hands on and mold and make in his image and likeness. Don't you ever oversimplify somebody when they walk into this church because you don't know who they are and you don't know what they're going to do. Listen, I feel the Holy Ghost right now. We've got to learn to look at people as God looks at them, as somebody that's created to be something great, created to do something wonderful, created to make his kingdom big, created to do something for somebody else. You don't know their testimony. It's easy to put a false label on them. Listen, we've got to emancipate ourselves from childhood dependency. We ask counsel, seek counsel, but we still got to realize the final decision is ours. Spiritually mature person can meet strangers easily. They enjoy being with others and planning with others. They can accept, watch, and adjust to the rules and laws of the group of which they're a part. Well, that church does this. This church. Are we maturing or not? They don't amass armies against each other. They work within the systems. And by the way, a spiritual person will make construct constructive contributions to the world that they live in. Stand to your feet. When we talk about spiritual maturity, we learn what to do and what not to do. We adjust ourselves to other people. Paul said it. When I was in Rome, when I was amongst others, I became like them. Why? To win some. 
If you're spiritually mature, you've got boundaries. Boundaries. If there's anything we need nowadays, it's boundaries. We've got to have boundaries. Your home ought to have boundaries. Your relationships ought to have boundaries. Your, the way that you do things ought to have boundaries. No, we don't do that. No, I'm not going there. No, I'm not doing, no, I'm not watching that. No, I'm not a part of that. No, I'm not getting involved in that. If somebody comes up to you and gossip, you ought to have a boundary and say, let's go talk to them now. That ought to be a boundary. A spiritually mature person will live life to the fullest today. Amen? That doesn't mean we don't plan for the future. We plan for the future. But we don't miss the importance of today. Right. Tuesday night, eh. How important is this? See, we can't miss the importance of what's going on right now because we're not promised tomorrow. You don't know what's happening right now in the heavenlies that you can be a part of, but you've got to realize, you, yes, you plan for the future, and yes, you're planning for things to come, and you're planning, but God might be working right now in front of you. So we've got to look at that importance of right now. Godliness with contentment. It's great gain. What is spiritual contentment? What is it? Spiritual contentment is knowing who Christ is in me. Knowing who Christ is in me. Real contentment only comes from him. And those who are content will show signs of maturing. Amen? It comes from responding to the teaching. It comes from ultimately becoming like Christ. I've told you this before. The, the, there should not be a big step between here and eternity when God calls your name. You should look as close to him as you can get before you, before you step over into eternity. James chapter 1 verse 4 in the NIV says perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Mom, dad in this room, you've told your kids this numerous times. Why don't you just grow up? Oh, you've told her. We've told our spouses, why don't you just grow up? I haven't told my spouse that because I don't like my couch. But how many times have we said, man, I wish they would just grow up? If we're going to be the church that God wants us to be, we're going to have to spiritually mature. I'm going to start a, a series next week about discipleship and about moving into that spiritual realm of spiritual maturity. Now, I know as soon as I said that, you're like, oh, I thought that's what we do during that class that you had. <laughs> Let me just give you a hint. I don't think you can call yourself a Christian if you're not discipling. If you're not discipling somebody, I'm not sure you can call yourself a Christian. Because there was a command given in Matthew. Go ye therefore and make disciples. So the Bible has this nice way of telling us to grow up. It says that it takes time. It's time well spent. It tells us that we should be trying to mature. And it does this in Matthew chapter 13. And it's defined through the parable of a sower. The one who sows on good ground, on good soil, will see what? 
growth and harvest. Growth and harvest. He produces a crop yielding a hundred, sixty, thirty times what was sown. So the Bible, through Jesus Christ in the parable of the sower, tells us it's time to grow up. It's time to take what I've sown into you through your word, through my word, and make you grow in him. So make sure we grow up. Now, I'm not saying not be childlike in your faith, but I am saying be spiritually mature. Let's bow our heads. God, help us not be frustrated or impatient or blaming of others. God, teach us contentment as we go through discomfort. Teach us, Lord, to be patient in the middle of frustration. Teach us, Lord, to be humble and have humility in the midst of all the things that we go through. God, help us to learn your ways, to be what you called us to be, to use, Lord God, good counsel, to make sure, Lord, that we can change the things in us, Lord, that we need to change. And God, if there's something that doesn't need to change, that it's good, make sure that we don't change it just because of somebody else. Help us to stay focused, God, and on the right path. And ultimately, God, help us to become like you. So that one day, God, when you call our name, we, Lord God, walk over into eternity. And you say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into your reward. God, I thank you right now that there are those in this room that are maturing. I thank you, Lord, for those that are recognizing some areas of their life, God, where their frustration might be because they are saying, no, I don't want to go that direction. But, God, you're calling them, Lord, to a higher place. You're calling them, Lord, to a higher walk. You're calling them, Lord, to a higher dimension. And, God, I'm asking you, Lord, to help every member of this church, Lord, including myself, continue to mature spiritually and to help us, God, be mature saints of you, mature saints of the church that when we leave these four walls, God, we can go and make disciples of others. God, I pray that right now in your precious name and everyone say amen. 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 Turn to somebody and say, become mature. Turn to somebody and say, keep maturing. Turn to somebody else and say, are you mature? I love each and every one of you. God bless you. By the way, we missed last week, Tuesday, Sister Clancy. It was her birthday. She's turned 29. We missed that. Hallelujah. She's stuck behind the windows there, or behind the monitors. But happy birthday, Sister Clancy. We missed it. And then I think tomorrow, yeah, or no, is Thursday is Sister Brittany's birthday. So we're excited about her turning 15 or 16, whatever it is. Hallelujah. God bless you all. Wish them a happy birthday or a belated birthday. We're so glad that you were here and you're dismissed.